Hello, English 121. This is Professor Robin Russo, and I'm one of the folks that is doing course design here for this English 121. For our first two modules, we're going to have a little bit of a video lecture. You're going to need this for your module quiz, but as well for completing a lot of the assignments here. So just a reminder of that. Um, before you jump into this, you'll want to make sure that you've read all the assigned chapters that are here in module one. Um, I also would encourage you to come back to this presentation. You will see that the full slideshow presentation is going to be in Canvas for you to come back later. Um, so you're going to need that in each case. All right, let's go ahead and jump into this slideshow about what news is. So I'm going to just begin with a few examples of professional working journalists talking about what they think news is. So this first So again, if you want to come back to this and view the whole thing, it gives you a good overview from a lot of working journalists as to just what it might be. I'm going to give you a second one that's um, from the BBC, so a more international perspective, but I think can also help us have this beginning set. Let me just pause that for a moment. So again, you can come back and watch these full versions, but as you can see, professional journalists are giving us this basic description about what news could be, about it being information that might need to be known, but also thinking about the responsibility that's there. But when we look at some of the things that we're going to review in our first module here, I go to three really big points, relevance, usefulness, and interest. To their audience. Chapter 5 of our textbook also expands this with these other qualities, immediacy and timeliness, proximity, currency, 
Prominence, Impact, Technology, and Conflict. So let's take a look at these values overall. What journalists do to decide this is something worth reporting versus this is something that we don't need to give to our readers. So looking next at impact. Impact means how many people are going to be affected by a story. Um, so a journalist's job is to think carefully about how any event could impact their readers' daily lives, whether now or in the, short, the, the long term. So it might be something that's happening right this minute. Think about the news you watch when you turn on, say, the morning news before you head out to school or work in the morning. You'll be given information like traffic and weather. Why? Because you need to make a decision about what you're going to wear and which way you're going to go. But then if we think about some of the stories that might be a little bit longer, that are on some of the national news stories, they might be something that's due covering a bigger trend, you know, something about saving for college. That might be something that you just had a child and you need to begin to think about that now, but it's going to impact your life 20 years from now. So a journalist's job is to really think about that. Where's this impact going to come? So I get this example of when I was working as a newspaper, um, as, as a newspaper journalist in a small town newspaper, um, I would regularly get press releases from all kinds of places. And one came from a pharmaceutical company that was not that far from where we reported and originally just said, OK, that they're going to be raising some prices on certain contraceptives. Um, and it looked dull to me at first, but then I had been working on some other stories that involved the public health facilities. Um, so I called some nurses at these same public health facilities that I talked to a few weeks ago and found out that the impact was really great. A lot of them were worried about clients not being able to afford this, um, having more clients come to them with unplanned pregnancies or, you know, otherwise being stretched. And so this thing that seemed like it wasn't important, I was able to make the impact by recognizing another story that I'd done on public health recently. So moving next to another one, conflict. Now, this is one of the things that I think is important. A lot of people think all news is bad news, but we do have to think about this. When there is conflict going on, a journalist's job is to consider all sides of a conflict and so that they can present the most fullest side. Now, as we'll learn throughout the rest of this presentation, the fullest side doesn't always mean that everybody gets the exact same coverage. So, for instance, when we have things that are demonstrably false, journalists often do not go ahead and let that person go ahead and talk conspiracy theories. Uh, we don't need to investigate into that once we can demonstrably prove it's false. But if we have reasonable people who have different opinions about a topic, we do want to be looking at all the sides that they say. Novelty has to do with the idea that news is the bizarre. So if you want to look at something that is out of the ordinary, that's also often something that is going to come up as an interesting piece of news. And proximity. This is very important. What is a story in the Washington Post is different than what's a story in Leesburg today. And it's certainly what's different than what's going to be a story on something like USA Today. Um, so when we've got something that's happening, how local is that? Prominence. Important people can create newsworthiness. I always think about this idea about, you know, well, why are we hearing about all these politicians or large public features, uh, figures, affairs? They're considered newsworthy because that might be a person that has that that is a public figure that everybody already knows a lot about, whereas you're not going to see your local newspaper report on your neighbors that are having that same problem. Timeliness, it just means that something must be new to be newsworthy. Um, so the way Internet works and especially the age of smartphones and their attendant apps always updating, news has to be timely. So news reporters, part of your responsibility is to make sure that you're reporting as quickly as possible without making errors. So I go back to when I was a student journalist myself. Um, I was a college student during September 11th. And I remember at that time of those terrorist attacks, the Internet was still um, a somewhat new uh, feature for most people to be using. But most major newspapers did update their website more than once a day. And so the, that was where all the breaking news from this was coming. However, because folks were not as used to working on such a tight deadline, there was erroneous news reported, including things like um, there was erroneous reports about the White House or the Capitol being on fire um, that led to more chaos. And so it's always this idea about am I balancing the quickness of my reporting with that accuracy? So here's a example of whether or not something would be newsworthy right here. So this comes from my own reporting experience. So consider this scenario. In Baden, Pennsylvania, it's a former small steel mill town of about 7,000 people west of Pittsburgh. A sophomore just won the Beaver County Science Fair for a project. The project investigated the number of adults who washed their hands after using the bathroom and the result found very low rates. 63% for women and just 18% for men. 
The results are collected over several at several bathrooms in the local Beaver Valley Mall over the busy eight-hour period on Black Friday, so the shopping day after Christmas, which made the project so interesting to judges. This is the same mall that was home to America's largest hepatitis outbreak with 600 people sickened and three killed after eating in a Mexican restaurant in the mall. The students said she wanted to see with the outbreak, which was eventually linked to green onions, but which officials said may have been spread so far because of hygiene problems, had encouraged any changes. The county health officials were shocked and vowed to ramp up hand washing campaigns. So for a large newspaper, USA Today, something national, for the Beaver County Times, the local newspaper there in Beaver County that I was working for, or for something like a large nightly news program, but their public health section. Would you rate this as newsworthy? Think about that for a minute, and then we can go forward and talk about it. So when we look at something like USA Today, it's probably not gonna be newsworthy. It is interesting, um, but unless the reporter discovered a few other stories like this and you could lump it together into a feature, it's not gonna be newsworthy enough. Versus the Beaver County Times, I was the reporter there at the time, and I did write this story because yeah, it was proximity to the readers, um, it's showing audience a slice of their own behavior, it also has an impact on the readers, it shows them a potentially dangerous situation. We know this is a place that has dealt with some health problems in the past. And of course, there's just certain novelty in, in the ick factor. I think people like to think about themselves as clean people, but when you see numbers like 18%, a little bit scary. Um, and then if you look at something like the national news, this would again be possibly newsworthy. Let's say that it is a localized story that can help us see a larger trend. So the CDC might be trying to get people to wash their hands. This might actually be something that would be relevant again now as we move from pandemic to post-pandemic phases and are people forgetting about some of those basic hygiene that were so important just a few years ago. So next I'm going to talk about the type of news stories. There's news, also called hard news, features, and opinion or editorial. Each of them has different qualities and each can be important to our audience for different reasons. News, it's sometimes referred to as the hard news. These are the things that are recent or current events. It's updated continuously as the story unfolds. So um, I've got an example here in March 2013. Um, there was a new pope being elected right here. And then you can see that what the story looks like. It says, here's what happened. Here's what time it happened. So it's giving us what we call the five W's and H, the who, what, where, when, why, and how right away. Um, versus something like a feature. Now, a feature is the type of story you're going to report. We're going to go into depth in this in the second module. But a feature story is looking for more narrative appeal. The story is not breaking news, but it can often be focused more on a trend, an interesting individual, or an interesting group of people. Profiles of a new head of state or a local business person would be a type of feature. So too would a story that's covering a trend. How many elementary kids use smartphones? Um, or how many more men are entering a, fear, a field that used to be more women? like teaching or nursing, or vice versa, the other way around, women entering a career that was considered um, more for men. So here's an example on the next slide of a New York Times story on a decline in dating culture. There's no five W's, but you can see that the reporter, is, the writer is exploring a trend. And that the writer, if you read the full story, which is linked here, creates a narrative for many examples. So if we look at the beginning of this feature, we can see we sort of hone in on this one person. Maybe it was because they had met on OkCupid, but when the dark-eyed musician with artfully disheveled hair asked Shani Silver, a local social media and blog manager in Philadelphia, out on a date Friday night, she was expecting at least a drink, one-on-one. -on -one. At 10 p.m., I hadn't heard from Zen Miss Silver, who wore her favorite skinny black jeans. Finally, at 10.30, he sent a text message, hey, I'm at Pub and Kitchen. Want to meet up for a drink or whatever? He wrote before adding, I'm here with a bunch of friends from college. And so in... As we see, then it begins to bring into this idea about the idea um, that they're saying that there is no such thing as real diggity dates anymore in this time. So again, there's a the full, full story if you want to learn more about what women were saying 10 years ago about how hard it was to date in places like New York and Philadelphia. And then opinion editorial. These are the places where a journalist will take a clear stance on the issue. As we're going to discuss shortly, most of the writing that we are going to do in this class and most of good journalism is where you want to remove yourself. So opinion sections of a newspaper are always clearly labeled. They will say opinion or commentary. And then the editorial is where a board of folks, it's usually a combination of reporters and editors, 
work together to give the paper's stance on the topic, sort of saying that since the paper has spent a lot of time reporting and researching some of these controversial issues, this is what they're going to look like. So again, you've got this older one right here, which is the post weighing in on the increase of cyber attacks around the world. So they've been reporting the news of each of these cyber attacks. And we can see in the next example that they have a um, opinion about what should happening, what should be happening right here. So it's explaining what should come next from their personal sides. That is an inserting of an opinion. And again, if you start to read news, as you're going to have to for your journalist journals, you'll see that the opinion stories in a responsible news organization are always very clearly labeled as such. So why does that matter? For news stories, both features and the hard news story, we as American journalists, at least, our highest call is supposed to be the call of objectivity. It's a principle which means the truth unmodified, the facts free from personal opinion and biases. So your reporting focuses on interview subjects, the event being covered, the surroundings, and not on your personal feelings, not on personal conclusions or preconceived notion of what the story should look like. So this is a very tricky concept because it is, of course, almost impossible to be fully objective. Let's listen to a few veteran news reporters discuss this. Um, we're first going to look at the set of 10 principles that come from the University of Missouri about objectivity. Journalism's first obligation is to the truth. Its first loyalty is to citizens. Its essence is the discipline of verification. Its practitioners must maintain an independence from those they cover. It must serve as an independent monitor of power. It must write a poem for public criticism and compromise. It must strive to make this significant, interesting, and relevant. It must keep the news comprehensive and proportional. Its practitioners must be allowed to exercise their personal concerts. Citizens, too, have rights and responsibilities when it comes to the news. This is one, and this is a set of principles that the University of Missouri has had for quite some time. But I think it's particularly important for us as journalism students right now to think about. What is our role as a consumer of news with regards to what we share? Are we thinking about whether what we share on social media, on text, on other personal platforms is something that really adheres to these ideas or might be something that is just unfiltered opinion um, and maybe might have biases or lack of accuracy? So is objectivity impossible? It's difficult to cheat, achieve, and we as humans might not so subconsciously we're always judging. You might also see reporters using I all the time. That's true. First person narrative is common in many forms of journalism today. Things like travel writing or a review, obviously a journalist has to insert themselves in the story. So why do we bother to try? Fairness and accuracy, they're on the decline because of the platforms of self-publishing and increasing punditry. Especially now that news can be curated for us through all of our social medias. What we click on, as we know, gives us advertisements, gives us a certain curated set of what we're supposed to look at. What this means is that we are often fed only those stories which the algorithms for these companies think we're already going to like. So objectivity and keeping that in mind as you're going through this course, this open-minded spirit, it's essential for good journalists. You've got to be willing to seek out strangers. You've got to be willing to talk to people who differ from you or put yourself into unfamiliar situations. Moving the focus from your own opinions to what you observe and to what others say is a vital practice for any beginning journalist. Okay, so let's listen to a few professional journalists now talk about this. This is Cynthia McFadden, who has been a TV journalist for a long time on ABC. So there's some examples right there about that idea of 
trying to get balance in, but that it can be um, important to think about even the restrictions there. Next, we've got Dan Rather. Um, so we're not going to watch the entirety of this clip, but Dan Rather does have, I think, some very important points for us to think about. <laughs> 